I, I brought something. Yeah? So I'm here at Micro Center, and uh, you might not realize it, but building a uh, computer where the processor alone costs almost $4,000, that can be a little intimidating, but Micro Center has a build service to help you with that build. And Micro Center is helping me with the launch of the 3990 in terms of let's benchmark it, let's run Linux on it, and let's do all kinds of stuff. But we're here to talk about a little bit, at least, the build service, because they'll help you build it so you don't screw it up, because there's like a lot of pins. Yeah, a couple. Uh... Like that one that's messed up? Oh yeah. That means it totally doesn't gone. work. We can fix it. We have the technology. So tell me about the build service. Uh, basically, if you're not happy with uh, the way a pre-build looks, or if you have something specific in mind, uh, we have an entire department where you can come in, uh, pick out your parts, um, and our associates will help you do that. Um, they'll get you anything you want. Um, so if you want 128 gigs of RAM, we'll get that set up for you. If you want a couple SSDs, we'll throw them in RAID for you. Um, it'll be brought back to one of our A-plus certified technicians um, and he'll have it done in usually one to two hours. Depends on what you have going. If it's something like a hard to liquid cooling. It's <laughs> That's going to take a little longer. It probably longer. costs a little extra too. Yeah, a little extra, yeah. <laughs> um, but he knows what he's doing. He's probably well over 100 builds at this point. So, so what if you're a, a certifiably insane person like me and you actually like want to participate in the build? Because I noticed there's a huge pile of parts built up behind us. Uh, we'll uh, work out some scheduling and uh, our techs will do it alongside with you. And <laughs> it's, a little um, bit, it's a little bit like the, uh, the secret, must get ready for the build. Yeah. So Micro Center. Really it exciting. Out, turns out that uh, this particular Micro Center, I've actually spent tens of thousands of dollars over the years, probably north of 100,000, maybe north of 200,000, because I got a lot of stuff I gotta buy. So I think we've got a build to do, let's get building. So they've got the bench set up. This is like a geek's smorgasbord, a geek's buffet. So I would have already called in ahead of time and let them know what I was looking for in terms of the build. We've got the $4,000 processor. Obviously, I'm sorry, 3990. We got the 3990 that's 3990 US, which is 64 cores, 128 threads. We got the ROG Zenith Extreme Alpha. This is the new one with the beefed up VRMs for this particular processor. We got 128 gigs of G-Skill Trident Z Neo, dual Samsung 970 plus SSDs, tons and tons of touch aqua fans. Is this, do you think it's gonna be enough fans? I think it's gonna be enough fans. So. <laughs> Dual EVGA 2080 Ti, the fastest GPUs that you can get right now. We got the full EK cooling kit. So this is the Dynamic O11 XL case bracket kit thing. Which is, actually, this is kind of hard to find. Yeah, a distro plate. Don't see them around all the time, yeah. but we carry them. That's nice. We got the Dynamic XL case, obviously. EVGA 1600 watt power supplies and dual bits power rads. So. Things are getting uh, getting serious. Let's unpack and do a build. I love what they do with the wire management in the in the Lee and Lee because you get the dust filters and they cut the little notch out for everything and you get the, the rubber grommets. They really do a lot with all the different, you know, sort of innards. Yeah, if you've got the space for this case, I mean, especially for the 24 pin, getting that angled grommet really helps out a lot. So this is the most horrifying part of the build. And by horrifying, I mean, it's actually pretty fun, but this is the part where if you're careful, you can do it on your own, but the Micro Center build service, really, this is, this is cool. I'm glad they're doing this. They can at least show you, if nothing else, because putting the processor into the socket correctly, you have to unscrew the screws in the correct order. If you apply too much pressure or not enough pressure, the CPU won't seat correctly, and things like RAM or PCI Express devices won't work. Worse than that, I've actually seen people rip off the standoffs uh, for the heat sink on the motherboard because of incorrect mounting pressure. So this is the part that you can absolutely screw up. Don't be above reading the manual or seeking out help if you need it. So Asus is unique in that they have this module that they call DIM.2, which is a vertical board that goes sort of here near the power connection on the front edge of the motherboard. And you can actually mount your NVMEs to that, but I'm just gonna put them on the motherboard. Remember when you're setting up your M.2 that there's also, there's a standoff and a screw. You might be able to install the screw without the standoff, but your M.2s should lay perfectly flat. There should be no mechanical stress on your M.2. We've got our on motherboard M.2 installed. We can replace our heat shield. Now, one thing that you wanna do when setting up your heat shield is make sure that you've got your thermal pads plastic removed. This will help carry heat away from the M.2 onto the rest of the motherboard. 
All right, so let's talk for a second about memory. 64 cores on this monster platform. Obviously, it's gonna be good with visual effects. We've done Linux benchmarking with things a lot more than visual effects, even like bioinformatics. One of the really interesting things, fast memory actually does make a fair bit of difference as long as you're doing more than just rendering. So we've got the G-Skill Trident Z Neo. This is a 3200 kit, 128 gigs and four sticks. Fast. Fast, yeah. I mean, there's faster, but at that capacity and whatnot, I mean, getting up to 3600 even, it's gonna be a challenge. CL 16, 18, 18, yeah. 38, that's pretty fast. All right, the next thing is setting up the block. So we've got the EK Velocity STR4 DRGB. Ah, that lovely plastic noise. Solid. It comes with the uh, ectotherm. It's fine. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, it's fine. And the very important, please remove before use. Mirror finish. So basically we're gonna mount this there. And this is a combination of uh, nickel, uh, nickel, uh, nickel plated copper. And then our fittings are gonna screw in here and this is gonna clamp down and be really nice. But uh, the first thing that's most important is uh, what's your school of thought on thermal paste patterns? Uh, for the couple thread rippers I've touched, I generally do the X because you need a bit more. Like um, a corner to corner X. Uh, I don't go quite to the corner. I'm a little, we don't want it squeezing out the side. So the next trick with these is tightening down corner to corner because you want even pressure as it smashes the thermal paste. So you don't want to tighten each opposite corner down all the way, but you know, you want to make sure that you're doing it about as evenly as possible. Next up is hooking up the power supply. Routing the cables, it's a little tedious, but doing a good job means that you're gonna have that much better airflow inside your case. So radiators, what's the goal of a radiator? It's just dissipate heat, right? Yeah. But not all radiators are the same. What do you look for in a good radiator? Uh, I mean, generally you want a decent thickness um, and enough uh, airspace to cool the components you have. So we're dealing with that 64 core monster. So we're probably going a little overkill with uh, <laughs> dual 360s. Dual 360, well, but I think the longer term plan is to water cool those EVGA GPUs because uh, EVGA GPUs will really sing when you let them. I mean, over two gigahertz water cooling. That's what I have at the back at the shop. But uh, yeah, yeah, I have one of those for the one threes on air still, and it it gets toasty. <laughs> so we've got our fans put on the radiator and get our cabling, our RGB cabling, sort of roughly the way that we want it. Notice that I've turned my, I've been sort of careful, I marked the radiator so that I knew where the back of it was. And I've got the cabling so that I can route the cabling from the back. I mean, it would be unfortunate if the cabling were all on this side of the fan, right? I mean, you don't, you don't really want that. We also have enough fans to do a push-pull configuration, but there's not quite gonna be enough room to do that. It always is a lot of fun to do test fits with your stuff to make sure it fits together. So we've got the small rad in the top because the large radiator, it's just not, it's not gonna work in the top. There's not enough room for the fans and the radiator. But at the bottom, we've got so much room for activities. It's not a problem, we can fit it there. And if we wanted to, we could also do away with the distribution block, but because we're gonna have the water-cooled GPUs in the future, well, it doesn't really make sense to do that. So the long-term plan, dual 360s, push-pull, We've also got our EVGA 2080 Ti triple slot cards. Now these cards are perfectly fine. These are great cards. <laughs> Even if you're just gonna stick with air cooling, we are gonna do water cooling at some point. Not today, we're gonna hurry. We got a benchmark. I mean, this thing's getting ready to, it's out now. It's launching. We've got to, we're just gonna skip the spinning rims for right now. <laughs> so we're not gonna be able to do a push-pull configuration at the bottom. We have gotta pop these fans out. But for water cooling, then these only take up one slot. Yeah, I mean, with the block on there, you'd definitely be able to fit both sets of fans in there. Uh, just unfortunate. Just another reason that you need to work with Micro Center on your build because they'll help you plan all this stuff. Yeah, this is stuff that we'd either catch before we started building or catch in the act. And luckily, we'd take care of you from that point on. That is a brick-like card. Yes, it is. All right, let's get building. Any build like this, there's a wet part and a dry part. You ever make cookies before? It's like that. You put the wet ingredients together, you put the dry ingredients together. We've got the dry ingredients together. Now it's time for the wet ingredients. 
So we got our distribution block in here and we're gonna connect it directly to our CPU. I mean, 64 cores, liquid cooling for the CPU. That makes sense. We're not ready to hook up our GPUs just yet because this thing's launching. We gotta get it out the door. So we're just gonna hook it up directly with one cable and we'll get some more fittings and other hookups later and use our distribution block properly. It's alive. It's, yeah, after a lot of fun. It's the reset button, remember. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to do the honors? I would love to. Don't mess it up. Oh. What a build. What a build. Now, thanks to early access from Micro Center, we've got a full suite of benchmarks on the Level 1 website. The 64 cores, I mean, what can you even do with 64 cores? Well, the visual effects industry is gonna be on its head. We're gonna hear a lot more about Hollywood and rendering and all the cool movies and stuff. AMD's really been able to tout that, but there is also a use for programmers and DevOps. You look at things like the Linux kernel, it's about 20 seconds. It's really not much of a speed up over the 3970X, but for larger projects and things like integration testing, modifying Git, the version control system, to do uh, <laughs> Git bisect, but more than one at a time, so that you're running hundreds of VMs doing regression testing, lots of simultaneous compiles. Yeah, the 64 core shreds and stuff like that. Things like bioinformatics, again, depending on what you're doing, our particular Micro Center build also has CUDA, so you can use CUDA acceleration or CPU acceleration. Believe it or not, CPU acceleration is great for researchers that don't have regular data sets or even normalized data sets. That's better for CPUs than GPUs. We tested all of that with Gromax, the performance. The only thing that's faster for Gromax is a dual 64 core Epic. But this single 64 core, because of the clock speed delta, is within spitting distance of 128 core, 256 thread Epic server. And again, all of that is on the Level 1 website if you wanna check it out and do the details. I'm sure we're gonna have a couple other videos on this system and the benchmarks coming up in the next few days, but the full rundown's on the website. Basically, the short version is, if you have something that will scale to 64 cores, this scales well. It scales shockingly well. Most applications uh, will scale at least a little bit. It's not like the 2990 WX where we had, uh, you know, we were able to observe regressions from moving from 16 to 32 cores with some applications. So there was a strong, it's like, hey, I, you know, I probably could use the 32 core for some things, but I don't want the stuff that can't use it to slow down. We don't have this on this CPU. Even though it's max single core boost is about 4.3 gigahertz, it's just a hair slower, but uh, you know, real world, it's basically the same speed. Look at Geekbench, you know, Geekbench is gonna be a little bit faster. And on the Linux side, things like our BMW benchmark, yeah, Linux is gonna be 30 seconds faster on the, uh, over 30 seconds faster on the classroom benchmark. So that's a two minute and 30 second render on Windows, same settings, same everything on Linux. It's one minute, 57 seconds. 30 second savings, that's pretty substantial. But that took clear Linux and some tweaking on the Linux side because each different Linux distro has different performance characteristics. So even on Linux, 64 cores struggles a little bit across all the different distros and all the different settings that you might be running with a particular Linux distro. But if you put in the work and tune it, you can get that 40% plus performance uplift, assuming that your program will scale to 64 cores. Your problem is big enough for 64 cores. Garrett, we got the build put together. Yes, we did. We got the benchmarks done. Today's Friday. It's February 7th. We're launching the 64 core Threadripper today, right now. Real exciting. Somebody can actually walk into your micro center and buy that. Yep. Or a 64 core boxed processor, which we've got around here somewhere. Not in the box, but. And we got the full benchmarks. Now, the 64 core CPU, as you might imagine, I mean, it's not a gaming CPU. You don't. No. Somebody's going to come in. It's like, hey, I've got a, a gaming computer I want to buy. And uh, it does have dual 2080 Ti's, which is about the best you can get 
for gaming, but yeah. 64 cores, what do, you, what do you do with that? Well, that's why I'm here. So we've done testing for Gromax. We've done testing for uh, biological sequence alignment. We've done testing for uh, compiling programs and of course visual effects. Visual effects is huge. You might have seen the video that we did with the 3970 Threadripper. We were using Adobe Premiere and mm -hmm. a, another program called Render Garden. Yeah. What Render Garden does is it'll take the job and split it up and then you can keep all 32 cores busy. Well we've also tested that on 64 cores and it turns out it just scales all the way up. It's just the 64 core is just it's unreal. Now our system here it's got 128 gigs I've tested both 64 gigs, 3600, 128 gigs, 3200, and 256 gigs at 2933, but I had a lot of trouble getting the 2933 to work properly. 2666 is what's supported, but 3200 with 128 gig, unless you really need the 256 gig, I don't know. If you need more than 256 gig, you can go e epic. Yeah, you can, you can scale up there, but. Yeah, yeah, so, but dual 2080 Ti's. Did we ever figure out how much this would set somebody back? A lot. I think it was roughly around 11 grand when we were adding it up. <laughs> um, $11,000 of computer and then some. Micro Center will be more than happy to help you get this put together. You don't have to be intimidated by all the 4,000 pins and if you just do this, if you just breathe on it wrong, the socket is ruined. They'll be more than help, happy to help you put that together. But more importantly, if you're gonna build, you know, an AM4, you know, like a B350 yeah. with like the six core, like the 1600, 1600. AF. That's, you, you guys sell a lot of those. Oh yeah, it's probably the highest selling processor right now. So even if you're gonna get a system like that, they're gonna help you build it if you want, if you want them to help you build it, because it's better for them to help you build it and not mess it up than you mess it up. So thanks to Micro Center, I got the benchmarking oh, yeah. in for 64 cores. It's 128 threads, it's just unreal. Now of course, we're testing Linux. Windows is a little bit on the struggle bus with uh, 64 cores and 128 threads because it, it splits it up. It treats it into two processor groups. But we're going live with questions right after this because we kind of did this a little beforehand, but a little bit yeah. a little bit live. So I've got to get back to the office so I can take your questions. I need to go to the nearest telecom rack so I can get back to the office. <laughs> uh, up the stairs and to the right. <laughs> Ah. What's up? We're live. For all you naysayers, you can now ask quite up. Oh, Dessuri says, great stuff, $50. I've got to mail you a processor later. Well, actually, try to get it on Newegg or Amazon so I don't have to run back up there because all this travel by telecom rack, man, it's rough. It's super rough. But get the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme Alpha. The Alpha. You don't want the not Alpha. Trust me. The Alpha. The Alpha is the one that you want if you're going to go for the ROG Zenith 2. But we've got good representation on the table here. We've got the 32 core, and we've got the uh, the competing, this is the evil twin. This is the mirror universe. This is the Spock goatee system. It's another Lee and Lee Dynamic XL, but that's the W3175 with the dark SR3. So uh, everybody says, hey, how's it going? 3990 plus tax, yes it is. And uh, big thanks to Micro Center for getting me access to this CPU ahead of time so that I can do the benchmarks. We're updating the article on the website with the graphs right now. It's a little rushed, so I don't 100% know if it's if it's nuts, but like scoring over 30,000 on Cinebench is doable with PBO and uh, really high-end cooling, like custom loop insanity cooling. 64 cores, over 30,000 on Cinebench. It's 25,000 out of the box. It's completely insane. <laughs> Al Bundy says, I like boats. Well, we're live. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, the system as configured from Micro Center, you know, was like 11 grand on change, maybe a little more than that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, obviously you shouldn't be buying that kind of a system unless you're going to get something out of it. Like you don't just buy that kind of system to just have. That's not a gaming system. That's not, you know, an everyday system. But the, the fact that systems like that exist mean that you can benefit, you know, at a lower end, like a six or eight core gaming machine, the price is going to be pushed that much lower when you've got other machines that are as high end as the 64 core. And if you want to dip your toes into Threadripper land, 
the 24 core is just, it's actually a phenomenal value. I was a little worried about the $1,400 price at first because there wasn't really anything in that sort of no man's land of around $1,000 for a processor. Because, you know, 10 years ago, $1,000 for a non-server processor was a little unheard of. And it's like, mm, 24 cores, $1,400. But with the way that AMD does stuff, and then you can buy the second generation Threadripper for around that price. But man, this thing is so good. It is so, so good. My 3900X is locking up on an Ubuntu 19.10. Double check your power supply, <laughs> Galinda. I <laughs> better up my Patreon. Yeah, it's a little. I might have might have splurged a little bit. This is a retail ROG Extreme Alpha, and look, check it out. On the bottom of the box, look the sticker. That is a real. That's a retail sticker. That is not a. There's no 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 sample. But you know, honestly, if I were AMD, I would only be sampling like VFX houses and esoteric sort of niche people that can figure out uses for it because I mean VFX is the obvious one but programming you know really for programming you don't need 32 cores unless you're one of those niche use cases research yeah research is completely insane so should be crazy you know for research type things do you think the CPU should support RDIM so the max memory capacity can actually be practically reached well you just get an epic I mean the the P epic CPUs are what you want in that case because the P CPUs only work in single socket systems, and that'll open up everything that you need. The worst thing about that is that you're capped at 3.35 gigahertz. So either you need a lot of cores or that ridiculous 4.3 gigahertz clock speed. But the difference from 3.35 gigahertz to 4.3 gigahertz for like research and rendering tasks, not really that much. And the P series CPU is not really that much more expensive than the $4,000 Threadripper. So you got options. Just finished recently building my dream PC with a 3900X paired with a Nitro Plus 57 XT, all with a custom loop. Do you think I would be good for at least five years? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, that 12-core CPU is a watershed CPU, in my opinion. The value is basically unbeatable. The dual chiplet thing means that if you're running a lot of background tasks, it's hard for background tasks to monopolize the entire CPU, so you can keep working on other CPUs because there's not really a lot of cache contention or anything like that. So... Whether on purpose or accidental, the 3900X is kind of a watershed CPU. That's going to be like, people are going to look back at that and be like, oh yeah, that's the 2700X. I mean the 2700X, the i7-2700, how it's kind of a legendary CPU. The 3900X, I think it's going to be a legendary CPU in the same way. But it's pretty cheap for what it is. Does it have the same weird uh, bandwidth issues that Linus had with his Epic server for NVMe, SSD, etc.? It's nice, I guess. So the the what what you're talking about is the 28 gigabyte per second limit from storage, and I think that's being worked on, but it's kind of an edge case. So if you're going to build an array that uh, is faster than 28 gigabytes per second, there will probably be a firmware update to help you out. But even if you're using four of the PCI Express 4.0 SSDs, that's only 20 gigabytes per second. So you're not going to run into that limit. Are you going to personally buy the CPU or is Micro Center giving you one? No, it's uh, Micro Center did not give me any hardware or anything. So uh, they did reimburse me for expenses and, you know, like I had a camera person and all that kind of stuff. But I actually spent more in actual real dollars at that trip to Micro Center that we used for filming than expenses, which is funny. But also, look, it's my dummy CPU. <laughs> Garrett about had a heart attack when I pulled that out of my shirt. I was like, hey, look at this. And he was just like, <laughs> it was so much fun. This is, a, this is a dummy CPU, by the way, which is actually on loan from one of our viewers. So thank you. Uh, I've tried everything to bring the CPU back to life. I think it's just a mechanical dummy. And uh, it's also missing a pad on the bottom. So that's definitely not the best situation. Would you consider a second or third gen i7 to be overkill for entry level home server router? Nah, it could work. I mean, it's fine. Stay calm, but there's a Decepticon sitting to your left. <laughs> this is the Antec. Yeah, I don't know. I've, it's, it's cool. The newness is sort of wearing off on me. I'll probably have it transplanted into a different case by the end of February. So, there you go. Game Bacardi says, hello. 
Is the SSD going to be the bottleneck? Yeah, well, so with the 3990, uh, it's funny because you really do need to get fast everything to keep up with the CPU. I mean, how crazy would it be to get like 32 gigs of memory but have 64 CPUs? I mean, that's, that's nuts. I would definitely recommend four DIMMs, 128 gig as the go-to configuration for the 3990X. Um, and probably at least a RAID 0, if not like a RAID 10 of SSDs. And you don't have to get the super expensive SSDs, but you know, like four one terabyte SSDs and then either a RAID 0 or a RAID 10. I mean, RAID 0, you, you need to have backups. RAID is not a backup. Uh, and so you're living a little dangerously in the, if one of them dies, they all die. But you could also do a RAID 10. You could do a RAID 1. Most people don't realize that you double your read speed with RAID 1. Almost nobody ever mentions that. But if you have uh, multiple read operations, you're doing something like Crystal Disk Mark, you will double your read performance with a RAID 1 because you have two different devices that can be read from. Writes stay the same speed, however, so you don't get the same speed doubling of writes that you do with RAID 0. So it just depends on what your thing that you're wanting to do with 64 cores is as to whether or not that makes sense. Oh, Scoosboro says, Splurge well deserved. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I did. We did. We did splurge for the 3990 launch. We really did. I, for me personally, the 32 core is my sweet spot. Like the stuff that I'm doing in Linux, even with my like insane VM stuff, and it's like, oh man, I've got to use this modified version of Git bisect to do regression testing to find where we introduced the bug, which involves spinning up these virtual machine web servers, you know, ten at a time. I'm hard pressed to to really stretch the legs of the 32 core, even running Linux, even with multiple Windows VMs, even with hardware pass-through, even with doing developer-y things. Uh, it's a game changer. The 30, 24 core or 32 core are a game changer with things like Unreal, if you're an Unreal developer. I'm trying to learn more about that from like actual real Unreal developers, so if there's anybody in the audience that like wants to take me under the wing, their wing and like coach me through a whole bunch of stuff. I've never done consulting for Unreal developers. So that's a little bit of a new territory for me, but I've done a lot of consulting for VFX people. And so this the 64 core is a game changer. The 64 core is actually a no brainer uh, for VFX people. You, you The 2080 Ti's, even over the Titan, a lot of the time makes sense depending on what the VF, VFX house is doing. There might be a few machines with Titans, but the 2080, the genie's out of the bottle, as it were, and NVIDIA is not going to be able to stuff that back into the bottle, even with the VRAM limitations. So for VFX, the 3990, absolutely 100% game changer in the industry and research and Linux and some of the other stuff. The most fascinating thing, if you look at our benchmarks, uh, different distros of Linux have kind of wide swings. Like Clear Linux has a wider swing for performance than I figured it would. But clear Linux plus my own personal kernel tuning, like kind of like the thing that I did in the Linux, the Linux, uh, Linus <laughs> storage server video, uh, those two things together, it was, I mean, a score of about eight on Indigo at the top end with a little bit of PBO, that's insane. Out of the box, Fedora, uh, Fedora 30 is only 6.5-ish in Indigo, and it's like 6.2 on Windows. You can tweak Windows a little bit and and get a little higher score, but eight on the Indigo bedroom scene? That's nuts, it's completely nuts. Oh, sorry, I've run behind on chat. I get rambly, you gotta stop me, sorry. What was the story, going somewhere, going something software to take payment if CPU threats go over 32 from server side? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, should we expect shortages with everything that's happening in Asia at the moment or have CPUs been manufactured and shipped by now? Micro Center, the local Micro Center had kind of a lot of them, but I expect they're still going to sell out because there are, even though this is niche, you know, probably. As far as fluid changing for custom loop, should it be every month, every three months, every six months? Like six months to a year, generally. I mean, if you don't have any, any colorant or anything that would like really, you just sort of look at it. Like this one... This is about two months old, and this is brand new, so you can kind of look at it and tell. Um, it probably about on a really if you, uh, it's like six months to a year. It just depends. You just you got to look at it. Just a little, little taste. No, don't taste it. That would be bad. <laughs> Bob Bob says amazing work. Well, thank you, Bob Bob. Does anybody else have any questions? Because I've got so much more building to do. Don't want to ramble too long. Just, I like hanging out with you guys. I mean, that's cool, but, you know. 
people with the 9900K. You know, uh, <laughs> the guys at Micro Center did say that uh, they sell the crap out of the 1600 AF. So, not surprising. Uh, 1600 AF might be the deal of the century. On <laughs> Although, Micro Center also has a lot of stuff on sale. Like, it was really hard not to buy the 2950X, because I've got some X399 boards here that are just sitting here not doing anything. And so it's like, oh, if I get this and a bundle with another thing, because it doesn't have to be a compatible part, I could get this 2950 for like $450. $450 for 16 cores and all those PCIe lanes. And it's like, oh, it's so close to the 3900X though. It's like, oh. So, yeah. What was that story? Something, something, something software going to take payment if the CPU threats go over 32 from server side. I don't know what that, I don't, that seems nonsensical. Any chance to test just uh, RDIMS, LRDIMS in desktop Ryzen systems, ASUS board? Yeah. So I did try RDIMS, no post. Anybody else have any other questions? What's the max boost clock? With a fully loaded and very high end cooling. Also, Micro Center is like the 2600X for $79. $79. I know, that's crazy. That's crazy. Because of the whole 1600 AF, the 2600X. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's such a deal. It's like, oh, should I use this second or third gen i7 for blah, blah, blah? And it's like, why would you? You can get the 2600X for like $80. <laughs> Throw that junk away, man. It's an antique. Um,. So, I think the chat might be broken because I'm, I'm getting the same chat questions from different people over and over again as far as fluid goes because I already answered that. Bibliophilus propylene, gas, uh, propylene glycol is catastrophic outside of a car cooling system. It gets enough to, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, does this CPU have enough cores for cats per second metric to start making sense? It really does. So in research, I didn't really get a chance to get into it in the video, but part of the research doing is like, what would you do with 64 cores? So researchers have regular data sets and irregular data sets. And a regular data set applies itself really well to SIM to type instructions and the types of things that a GPU would do. I mean, SIM type instructions are available on the CPU, don't get me wrong. It's AVX2, AVX512, FMA. Um, GPUs do it better because they have more cores that are slower, but... If you have a data set that has been somewhat normalized and organized, it will run really fast on a GPU. But a lot of researchers don't necessarily have that. So their first pass at software is not really well optimized and not really well put together. And so a general purpose CPU is generally better for that. So I was looking at maybe doing a demonstration with Clustal, which is like this bioinformatics thing. I don't know too much about it personally, but... It's not sort of bugging some friends. It's like, okay, how can we do this? Certain things that you might do with Clustal would make sense to have a, a massive number of CPUs. Other things that you would be doing with Clustal doesn't make sense for you to have a massive number of CPUs or GPUs. It's down to single thread. It just depends on what you're doing and the data set and what you're trying to accomplish. I'm at work, so I missed your response to my custom loop question. Can you repeat it, please? Uh, six months to a year, generally. I mean, you just you got to look at it, but generally it's six months to a year. If you have mixed metals, you may have to do it more often, and you may have to do some of that treatment stuff for, like, mixed metals. So, uh, how big is the cost gap of this compared to the entry-level Epic you showed off a while back? Not a lot. So if you get the P series CPU, the cost gap is is not it's not a lot, especially with workstation boards. And we're starting to see pretty high end, epic workstation boards come out where you're not gonna your computer's not gonna sound like a jet engine. Like both of these machines are on, and I'm hoping that in the microphone you can't really it, it doesn't sound like you know terrible. TR 1900X versus 2700X. I think that the 2700X is probably the better option unless you really need the memory capacity or the PCIe lanes, and you probably don't. If the system is not going to be populated with a bunch of peripherals day one, then just upgrade to something else later. You need to get VMware running before the 32 core license limit. <sighs> VMware. I mean, they kind of had to do that. I mean, I did the review of the Gigabyte dual 128-core server, 
it's a bag of holding for servers. Like you open it up and it's bigger on the inside. It's like that for virtual machines. 128 cores in a 2U chassis with fast storage and networking. I mean, I was, we took three racks of servers and it, they were not, it wasn't full 42U, but we're talking, you know, like 12, 15 systems per rack and easily and created a three node VMR cluster. So uh, three times 128, 384 cores. And that cluster is not even half loaded. Like not really. Epic is a bag of holding for servers. It really is, virtual machines. I have all copper parts for my loop. Good old XSPC photon. Oh yeah, XSPC, that's a good kit. A little off topic, would you consider doing an episode reviews of Picard? <laughs> There's a masochist right there. Oh, I'm, I'm hiding in the shadow of this computer. ECC memory on X570 motherboards. Not all not all motherboards support ECC to the same extent. Generally, ASRock supports ECC the best in that they'll, they will detect and correct one-bit errors and report two-bit errors. That's really the thing that you have to worry about is like, does it detect and correct one-bit errors? Does it report that error? And for two-bit errors, which are cannot be connect, uh, corrected, does it report two-bit errors? Those are your things that you have to worry about. Uh, Gigabyte boards, generally will work with the one-bit error correction. Two-bit error correction, it, it seems to depend on the BIOS version, um, which is weird. Um, but the in the in the long-running systems that I have, um, generally ECC is best supported on ASRock and then Gigabyte. And then ASUS sometimes, but ASUS is like single-bit correction silently on most of the more recent boards. So your mileage may vary. And that's a general statement because it's not true true on every single board from ASRock or Gigabyte or whatever. And it depends on the BIOS version. Have you done any machine learning benchmarking on it? Yeah, but it's a little bit, uh, so like in the benchmarks, well, yeah, but eh, it's complicated because you have to, you really want to tune the system for the machine learning benchmarks that you're doing. And also you want a machine learning benchmark that doesn't run particularly well on a GPU because just because a CPU will run a particular machine learning benchmark well doesn't mean anybody's actually running that on CPUs in general in the real world unless it's going to be dramatically faster than a GPU which it's not. But there are some times of, types of irregular learning data set stuff that you would be doing with machine learning that absolutely does not run well on a GPU so. Deathful Rage says, Unreal Engine Dev here would love to help you out. A lot of UE4 devs have to recompile the engine a lot. That takes up a lot of time. A new CPU like this could work wonders. Yeah, it definitely does. All right. Well, email me, dwindle at level1text.com, uh, or message me on the forum or whatever, and uh, uh, probably could get you into a 32-core system with TeamViewer or something. And then you're just going to have to like show me what to do. We're, we're going to have to do a call because I haven't done, un, I like, I haven't done Unreal Engine performance optimization before, but I can learn. Uh, does the IMC and Ryzen any different than Epics? Ah, uh, you know, I'm, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, kind of, because Epic has the eight channel thing. It depends on what you mean by different. <laughs> The IMC in the 2990, I was able to get to run at 3600, or 3990, I was able to get to run at 3600. The Micro Center kit was 3200, which is not an overclock. This system is running, uh, this is also a 128 gig 30 uh, kit from the OLOY, it's like the cheaper kit. Um, and this is running at 3200 just fine. Uh, that's a different system, but I've also got the, the Corsair Dominator um, 64 gig kit, and that kit is, like that is that kit is the sweet spot, like 3600, and it's like 16, 16, 16 timings. It's really, it's fast. It's really, really fast. It's very expensive though. What's the most comparable Intel chip to the 3990X? You know, Andrew Colbert, uh, there's not one. There's, there's not. Like this is the 3175, and this is overclocked. This, this system can do 4.6 gigahertz all core and 
five gigahertz if I limit it to like four cores. So it's like four cores, 4.5, and then like eight cores at 4.6, and then all 28 cores at like 4.5, 4.4. Um, then I get the single core scores and things like Geekbench with the W3175 system. Uh, if I added a one horsepower chiller, I could probably do five gigahertz on all cores, just like they did at Computex, because that was the same CPU. But um, even 28 cores, five gigahertz, it doesn't even come close. It's not, it's not remotely close. Okay, the real question is how fast is it mine Monero? Pretty fast. When will the B550 come out for purchase? Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be too long, but I don't have any insider info. What material is the heat block constructed from? Copper? Uh, Nickel-plated copper. <sighs> Woo! All right, does anybody else have any questions? I mean, I haven't... Uh, this, is, this is my board that I paid for with actual real dollars. Oh. And it's still in here. See? I've got a system that I, oh, I almost dropped it. That would be bad. This is not that channel. Oh, yeah, also, I've got another another system to put together. It's the Core i9. <laughs> it's on sale at Micro Center. Oh, Golinda, it's like $20. It says Gol. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Golinda. It's awesome. What is the state of VFIO and Looking Glass? I'm thinking about buying a 3900X and trying to set it up. You should basically be fine. Um, the NVIDIA cards have reset problems right now. You should read the, the threads on the forum um, to decide if you want to live with that or if you want to use an NVIDIA card with the driver, uh, the Code 43 driver workaround. The Code 43 driver workaround is much, much easier than dealing with uh, card resets, but in my opinion, but check the threads on the forum. There's a lot of info there, but Generally, the 3900X is kind of an unstoppable virtualization machine in its own right, so. Any other questions? It seems like he's trying to get rid of us for some reason. No, well, you know, it's got some, some building to do, some, uh, some things, some things are happening. Does it have 10 gigabit? Oh, that's a good question. I think it does. I don't see why it wouldn't. The other one did. Yeah, a Quantia AQC 107 10 gig LAN. Nice. Micro Center sells the one terabyte NVMe for 3.0 drives for $99. Yes, I have one here. I got one. I got one of those too. Well, I don't know where it's at right now, but I got one. Look, even the, you guys didn't even notice it. Did you notice there's an Intel Pentium Pro down here, which is the same in terms of like the physical size of the CPU. That was from Max CFM. He sent me that. Good guy. Trying to learn Linux and I have two VMs, an Oracle VM box program we went to admit. Do you have any other suggestions where I can learn a little a little bit quicker? KVM on Linux? Fedora has got a, a, a GUI for that. Boxes. You can install Fedora and then like go to the GUI program manager and install boxes and be up and running with VMs pretty much immediately. So Favorite distro? Oh, I don't know. It's a tough question. I like Pop! OS for gaming. I like Fedora for getting work done. I like how fast clear Linux is. So like in testing this thing, uh, testing the AMD processors with clear Linux with a customized kernel, that may need to be its own set of videos because it's dramatically faster. Liquid Media Games says hello. I always appreciate the support, Liquid Media Games. To this day, I feel shafted that they changed the TRX, TR4 to TRX4. I wanted to upgrade to the 64 core. Uh, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, because the TRX40 chipset is does a lot of things um, to really improve the situation with the chipset because it's a PCI Express by eight link, which supports a lot more bandwidth, and the new chipset also supports PCI Express four. So the alternative would be would have been to update the chipset to support four lanes of PCI Express 4, but that's not very future-proof for the platform, and that sort of does uh, people that are gonna run uh, peripherals like NVMe a little bit of a disservice. Right now, all the TRX40 boards generally have four X16 slots and not really a lot of by four slots, 
but it is possible to do the by four slots off of the chipset. So I think it's a better situation having that PCI Express by eight link from the chipset to the CPU, especially in terms of uh, being able to stuff more peripherals on the board, things like 10 gig LAN, which we see with the Gigabyte Extreme motherboard. That's, that's what this one is. Um, the dual Intel 10 gig LAN, plus a, a ton of NVMe on board, plus whatever. I mean, the, the ROG board has five NVMe on board. There's two on the DIM.2, .2, two underneath the heatsink, and one on the back of the motherboard. Five on board NVMe, no add-in cards, and you still got four X16 slots. That's a pretty good layout. Tai Chi Ultimate is still the cheapest motherboard with 10 gig E, right? As far as I know, yes. Uh, will it run cubes? <laughs> I need to test cubes. I need to revisit cubes and see. Uh, BSDs need some love here. That is a good, yes, I agree. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Because I really like FreeBSD 12 and on up. 13 might be where things get interesting. More interesting. Wish we had Threader for with 512 gigs of RAM compatibility. Kind of sucks that we would have to give up. Uh, 256 gigs is fine. I thought the same thing, but it's fine. And it's possible. Maybe we'll see quad rank DIMMs, and then maybe that would be a thing, but I don't, I don't know. That's just a guess. Is X470DU the only AM4 with IPMI? No. Hasrock just came out with another AM4 that is X570 and has IPMI and some upgrades. What's in the cup? Coffee. It always it always sucks all the energy out of me to travel by telecom rack. Ah. Will you do more ZFS videos and what uh, what and updates to your free net servers? Yeah, I could probably do that at some point in the future. <laughs> Join Patreon. <laughs> Beehive as a KVM alternative might make a good video. I really uh, I started to do that about six months ago, and I ran into hardware pass through issues, and then I found like a mailing list post that was like, "Oh, is somebody actually using this?" Well, let us know how that's going. And I was like, you know, I'll just put that on the back burner and see how that's going later. Uh, but yeah, Beehive is promising. With Linus Torvalds being against ZFS on Linux and BTRFS having data issues, what do you think of Bcache FS? Have you have you talked with Kent Overstreet? I've never talked with Kent Overstreet, and I need to learn more about Bcache FS. I think I'm fine with with Linus Torvalds being against ZFS, but that doesn't it doesn't like that doesn't affect my personal like why would it? FreeBSD running out of the box and rising in Threadripper. Uh, basically, yes. I still have, there's that weird edge case on some second gen Threadripper motherboards where it hangs on boot, but they got it working on one on the ASRock Fatality motherboard. So I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Hello from Taiwan. Should I be upgrading from my 3700X to this soon? Oh yeah, well, so the 3700X, you can probably wait till the 4000 series and get like the 12 or the 16 core in the 4000 series because you, you figure that maybe the price will drop a little bit on either the third generation stuff or maybe the fourth generation stuff will come in. But 3700X, eight cores, your next upgrade is probably 12 or 16 cores, whatever it is. And the 3900X is probably not enough of a jump unless you just like your friend was like, hey, I want the 3700X and then you, you could get a pretty good price out of it and then get the 3900X. But other than that, don't worry about it. Do you think ZFS and Linux will outdevelop FreeBSD ZFS? Some people are saying that's already happened. Some people are saying that FreeBSD ZFS implementation is sourcing features from Linux. Um, from the Linux side, that the Linux side is sort of more up to date. And that, that may be true. I mean, the big feature that I'm looking forward to with ZFS is the ability for pools to have mixed device types and sort of figure it out. So you can have slow and fast devices in a pool and that actually work well. Then you can really truly mix SSDs and hard drives in a ZFS pool. And I'm not talking about like S-Log and, and L2 Arc. 
and the performance will that will be game changing. Like if I were independently wealthy, I would have probably already sunk at least several hundred thousand dollars into that development quietly. Any opinions about WireGuard? It will be in kernel 5.6. I saw that. I need to look into it a little bit more. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I haven't, I haven't, like, the production systems that I run are still, like, super old kernels, so it's like, oh, that'll matter to me in about five years. With 64 core CPU, can you split it into four NUMA nodes if you want and call it UMA, uh, but you run into the issue, the window stops at 64 cores in a single node. Yeah, well, so I talked about that a little bit in the video, in the, in the pre-roll. Windows has problems, yes. Um, you can go in the BIOS and configure it to run NPS4, which will give you four NUMA nodes. And uh, that will help with very latency-sensitive applications. But generally, you would probably only want to do that on Linux, because it'll, it, Windows doesn't handle the performance really well. Now, unlike... Um, even though processor groups are kind of treated like NUMA nodes, they're not NUMA nodes. And so the performance of most applications are, is basically fine. It's not like the 2990, second gen 2990, where you would get a little bit of a performance regression. Um, generally applications that can use 64 threads at a time are already designed to deal with multiple sockets. And the bug in the Linux kernel that's exposed when you have a node that has no direct access to memory is not present on third gen. So there's no performance regression. You just don't get the full performance of all 64 cores for that application unless it's written to support it on Windows, which was a delightful surprise because your other nuclear option is to just turn off simultaneous multi-threading. If you turn off simultaneous multi-threading, then you have 64 cores and 64 threads. And with Cinebench, I can score about 21, 22,000 with 64 cores. Uh, 64 threads, but um, you know the stock performance is about 25,000. So from 21,000 on Cinebench to 25,000 in terms of multi-core performance, that's not that much of a loss if your sol if your program that you're solving for is very very important to you. You can just disable simultaneous multi-threading, and then all 64 processors will be in one group. But generally, in testing, I found that wasn't necessary. Still, it's a pretty clever solution, though, don't you think? In CFS on Linux, is it stable enough for production use? Yes, absolutely. Have you seen anyone in the enterprise use it on Linux? Yes, I have. Are these good, reliable chips for server use? I don't know. They just just came out. It's hard to say. I have been having a ball with uh, the 24 and 32 core Threadrippers. Like, I mean, it's almost like, you, you know the old memes? Like, you've reached the end of the internet. There's nothing more. Just turn your computer off. It's like, oh, I've reached the end of the internet today. That's what it feels like to use a 64 core CPU. I mean, so you sit down and it's, and you're, you know, you're running applications and you're doing stuff. And it's like, oh. I can literally just do anything, literally anything that I want, and it's fine. Did you see in our benchmark graph the, the article on the website? You know, like H.265 software encoding is just, <laughs> it's utterly insane. What is your take on the limitation of 256 gigs of un unbuffered memory? You can move up to Epic. So it's kind of nuts, but you can move up to Epic. It is a little weird because the, the W3175 system here can support a lot more memory. I wouldn't be surprised if in fourth generation Threadripper, they sort of throw that out. I wouldn't be too surprised if, like, because I, I don't know, we've got the dual rank 16 gig, that's what the 128 gig stuff is, which suggests maybe that we might see quad rank unbuffered DIMMs, maybe, possibly, but I don't know. So if, if we do see quad rank DIMMs with 16 gig ICs, maybe that means that the platform could support 
512 gigabytes, but that, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that, that happens, like, you know, when CPUs launch, it's like, oh, it only supports 128 megabytes of memory, and then memory density increases, like, oh, well, no, we support 256 megabytes of memory. And that happened a little bit with, like, say, 32 gig DIMMs, like, legit 32 gig DIMMs before they were available. It was like, well, it should support that, but we don't know. So there might be a situation like that, but the at first, before I actually got to play with the CPU, the 256 gig limit bothered me a lot more. Um, but after having played with a ton of applications, it really didn't bother me too much. I was also her helping Eric Raymond with a repo surgeon thing, and so I sent him a um, 512 gig Optane drive because he's he's on second gen Threadripper, and at same 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 limits, and he's at the memory limit, and. Uh, we used Optane for swap, and so we had 500 gigabytes of swap on Optane. And yeah, the throughput's not great at two gigabytes per second, but the latency was good enough, and that allowed him to sort of power through the particular problem that he was working on with not really a tremendous loss in performance. So those kinds of data points make me think that the 256 gig lim uh, you know, limitation is probably not bad for the particular niches that AMD is envisioning. And if it is, there's not that much of a loss from in terms of performance per core from moving from Threadripper to Epic. That said, I would love to see the 64 core Threadripper support unbuffered memory. That would be amazing, but I don't think the motherboards are designed for it. Does the industry in the U.S. trust Proxmox as as compared with something like X, CP, NG, VMware, etc.? I've never seen it in the wild, only in home labs. I think Proxmox is more trusted currently than X, CP, NG, uh, but VMware. Like, nobody ever got fired for buying VMware. And sadly, Hyper-V is trusted more than Proxmox, which is really a tragedy because about five times in the last seven years, between Broadcom and some other things, just Windows updates have completely, even the console only Hyper-V servers, Windows updates have just made a mess of those servers. It's like, oh, let me just renumber the NICs while we're at it. And it's like, oh, thanks. It's like, oh, Windows update has deployed the incorrect firmware binary blobs for your Broadcom network adapters. Oh, thanks again, Windows update. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So Hyper-V, has no been nowhere near as reliable as VMware or even Proxmox because of those kinds of shenanigans. And it's unfortunate because Hyper-V actually seems like it's a good product. It's just hamstrung by the fact that nobody really does any kind of testing and nobody really owns up when Microsoft makes one of those kinds of idiot bonehead mistakes. Like, the engineering is incredible. It's just like some middle manager down the line pushed a button and completely fouled the entire thing up because they're an idiot. And that is life with, with Hyper-V. Uh, VMware uh, is very solid and nice, but expensive. And Proxmox seems to be fairly solid, although uh, you really should be using their supported hardware. Because like when I was helping Linus with his, his thing on the forum, they were like, ah, these kernel loops, is, they're totally normal. It's fine. Nothing bad happens. And it's like clearly that person didn't research. <laughs> Cluster management needs to be decoupled from Windows Server. Ah, a man of world travels, I see. <laughs> it's not completely awful, but uh, can the 3990X run the late game Dwarf Fortress at 60 FPS? Oh, did they did they make it multi-thread? Ryan is really excited about that, but I don't know how that's uh, I don't know how that's going to work out exactly. All right. There's 943 of you here, and as much as I would love to just hang out for the rest of the morning, are there any more 3990 questions? Because I have been dragging on for far too long, over an hour at this point. And that's the last of my cavassier, I mean uh, coffee. <laughs> it's, it's an old Saturday Night Live thing, I don't, I don't know. Two years, finally got my 3950X up and running. I love the 3950X. I'm currently using the 3950X in my gaming machine, and I'm surprised at how 
how much zippier it is than the 3900X, especially when I'm sort of juggling a few things because like I'll play, be playing Stellaris and then I'll alt tab into something else. And uh, it's, it's better ish. It's better than the 3900X. It's so much better than 3900X. I don't want to admit how much better it is. Um, but I still think the 3900X is the best value. I mean, clearly the 3950X, that is a Halo product. That's just AMD being like, look, we can put 16 cores in this, in this, you know, this modest socket and it's fine. And it is fine. It's incredible. Do you like the color of the chip? It's a nice, it's a nice neutral gray. It's an earthy, sort of an earthy smell. We just had a general conversation Q&A where we just ran them for two hours. I mean, we could. If enough patrons demand it, we shall do it. We shall, we shall make it so. Needs more cowbell. Do you play Elite Dangerous? I do not. I don't have time. I've, I've been really, really low on time for games lately. A lot of, a lot of life stuff and, and general shenanigans. Um, so, yeah. I'm just going to get the article on the website updated. Going to 3950X with the X570 or its master soon. Yeah, good choice. 3900X is almost half the price of the 3950X in Norway, so I bought the 3900X. Yeah, see, I mean, 12 cores, and it's not just the core. I mean, well, it, it is actually just the cores. That's the part that I have trouble getting over in my mind. So you have the 3900X with all of that lovely L3 cache, 12 cores, and then the 3950X, it's all of the same everything, except you get four extra cores. And yeah, you get a little extra cache with the four extra cores, but that doesn't count because it's L3, it's a victim cache. You're not really getting extra cash. You're just getting the cash that goes with the course to use them. So you don't think about it that way. So you just get four extra cores bolted onto your system. And are you really doing things where 12 cores is bogged down, but 16 gives you a little bit more of a bump? And the answer to that is absolutely no. No, you absolutely are not. But the chiplets in the 3950 are a little better than the chiplets in the 3900. So it's like, uh maybe maybe that makes it more worth the cost differential but the 3900x is just such an incredible watershed cpu for what it is in 12 cores and the performance that it will it, it will bring up the whole industry like the 3990 it's a halo product it's niche and it's four thousand dollars which is a steal for what it is especially compared to what you would have been paying for the same performance just a year ago uh but the uh, the fact that the thirty nine the, the fact that the thirty nine ninety is as insane as it is is a testament to the overall technology and platform and uh, the cost of entry into that platform is only the twenty four core thirty nine sixty x so fourteen hundred dollars which is a steal for what it is as well. Oh, somebody gave us. 400 somethings. I don't know what that is. Thank you for your service. Uh, Sam Samos Kana. Well, thank you. We appreciate the support. Level 1 runs entirely, almost entirely, on fan support. So, it's pretty amazing. And this, this deal with Micro Center gave me access to the 3990 to play with. So, we'll have some other content coming soon. Oh, this is the Boiler Snake. The Boiler Snake's even here. Look at that. I got a 7356 multi-thread and a 509 single thread on R20 for 3900X. Is that good? That's pretty good. You could probably get a little bit better single core. I'm not sure what kind of, it's probably your cooler or something. I guess Sing says, Wendell please. Wendell please what? I don't understand. I'm running an ASRock, whatever. 3950 better been thinking of upgrading 3950 then move to 3900. 3950 might be a good move later when there's a price drop or something. I mean, uh, TSMC only gets better at production late game. Like you buy the like the 1300X. If you bought the 1300X right before they stopped making it, you could overclock it to 4.2 gigahertz, no problem. Whereas launch day 1300X is you couldn't overclock it 50 megahertz. Ken Clack says five dollars. Thank you. Uh, is the 2700X a good starting point for an unraid or proximal server? Yes. The relatively low power utilization, the 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 
the worst experience that you will have with Ryzen is if you cheap out on your power supply and you get random lockups. It is almost always power supply related and there's the whole like typical current, idle current. Um, and that's some I've spent, I don't know, there's not, maybe I should do a video on it at this point because that has been a black hole of time for me because a lot of our forum users have reported like intermittent lockups and I've literally, you know, behind the scenes been like, okay, I've got this board. Why don't you send me your board and I'll send you this board that I've been using for a few months and we'll just try it. And they're like, oh, that's great. Everything's fine. And then I get their board and everything is fine for me doing the same thing. So it's really, really odd. A couple of times uh, with more testing, the board was just effective and just need to be RMA'd. But I think that sometimes the RMA process at the AIB partner doesn't catch those edge cases where board kind of works, but kind of doesn't. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the, that's like the worst thing that you could possibly run into with the 2700X. And it's very good. But that's something to be careful of on the used market because it's like it'll work, but then it's like it's got that thing on Linux where like it's idle and it'll lock up which is almost universally fixable with BIOS settings or power supply. But sometimes it isn't, and it's like super frustrating. Try compiling the Linux kernel on this. That was literally in the benchmarks, 19 seconds, which is not a dramatic speed up over the 3970X in all honesty. The compile that was a dramatic speed up was GCC. So GCC with 64 cores is a dramatic speed up over the 32 core, but the Linux kernel, 19 seconds versus like 22 seconds on a 3970X, so meh. Andrew Cruz gave us $5 and says, level one runs on fan support. Me imagining the level one office is a drone hovering on Noctua fans, Noctua hovercraft win. <laughs> they need really high static pressure. We'll have to get the fancy fans for that. We won't allow you to leave. Someone grab a zip tie. I don't know. I mean, meh. Gonna need another coffee. Gonna have to also... Is that the Cincinnati Micro Center? It is! We found me out. It's in Sharonville. Skinwitch, $10. Respect from an engineer. Keep it up. Well, thank you. I try. I'm, uh, you know, in case it's not obvious, um, uh, the people that I work with uh, sort of keep me in the loop. So I just sort of listen to them and they tell me things. Should be good. Woo! Any other questions? Do you think the Power 10 will be good? Power 10 for what? Thread Ripper phone win? I'm just happy to see the three of you being so successful. It is surprising. Like, I didn't, I mean, I don't know. I think Linus probably said it best. It was like, oh, there's, there's 10 million of you weirdos. I'm surprised that there are 10,000 weirdos that are sort of into what we do, but at the same time, because YouTube is not really, like, a lot of the stuff that comes from YouTube comes from stuff that I experience in, in daily life that is sort of digested and reimagined for YouTube. Like, oh, we solved this problem that we can never talk about. And so, it's YouTube, YouTube as just YouTube is weird for me, because I actually mostly enjoy the consulting. I have a few problem clients that are just helplessly idiotic, but... I love them. I still try to take care of them, even though they don't understand the things I do for them. I still try. I want to see them be successful, but they're just they're just lost. The fluffy says, "Thanks for always putting the amazing content and your involvement in the community." Thank you. Appreciate it. Try to be more involved in the community, and then sometimes the content does that. For those who missed the start of the stream, there is a benchmark and a change of location. Very high tech stuff. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I go, I think you'll be able to replay it. It's really good. <laughs> Micro Center open box for the win. Oh, I didn't bring it upstairs. This for the win three. 
I got for just over a thousand dollars. That's like a $1,400 2080 Ti. I mean, granted the 2080 Ti is probably nearing the end of its life cycle, but that was an open box deal. It still got the EVGA warranty, just, you know, brand new, awesome, awesomeness. Um, and uh, it was open box and it was in perfect shape and micro center. Like I, I paid money for that. They didn't give me that. Uh, and it was just because it happened to be there in the open box. I have, to, there's a, I have a, I know somebody and then sometimes I get a call and they're like, hey, I got this thing. And it's like, ooh, yeah, I'll be, I'm on my way. Is it possible a monitor could cause a GPU to burn out? Uh, a really bad voltage spike on display port. I've actually seen that happen a few times. I think IBM Power 10 RISC 5 and the new ARM server. Oh, I love the power. I really want to. Anybody want to trade a 3175 for like a Blackbird system? <laughs> like a maxed out Blackbird system? Because, eh. <laughs> Is it possible to run two of these for 128 cores? You want Epic. You're thinking Epic. So yeah, I've got that machine downstairs. We did the video on that. Check out, just search for, uh, uh, search the channel for Dual Epic and you'll find that video. 3990X and 3080Ti build coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. Any plans for PCIe pass-through VM on the 3950X? I was wondering if assigning eight cores, one CCD to VM provides latency from inner CCD by removing even that even happening but with better silicon. CPU pinning is the current trick to maximize performance. You don't necessarily have to pin all of the CPUs on the same CCX. You should use LS Topo to look at your topology and see where your... Uh, where your stuff is attached and like do some measuring and be like, okay, I'm going to pin it to this, these CPUs and run my GTA five benchmark. And I'm going to pin it to these other CPUs and run my GTA benchmark. There, there will be a minor difference there. Um, and so if you do that, uh, it will run well, but eight cores for a windows VM is kind of, of a little bit overkill. Like it's for me, the sweet spot seems to be like six or seven threads because I guess when, uh, you know, Linux or whatever can do whatever thread management it needs on the other thread, the eighth thread in that CCD, which seems to help. But like, I'm not really doing anything on Windows that demands more than six cores, generally. Now, I might be running more than one Windows VM in the first place, but generally, I, I don't need more than six, six, seven threads on a, on a Windows VM. Andrew Cruz says, "Can you give? Can you guys do a my journey in computing video?" <laughs> Baby's first CPU. What got you curious? First programming. What you do now? Uh, there's not. There's not really. That's that's not a. At least for me, that's not a fun story. Um, basically, uh, <laughs> survival and hard work is a thing. But I don't know. Do you think the four-channel IMC is going to be a limiter on virtualization? It didn't seem to be. So one of the things that I, I didn't really get a lot of time to like screw around with it, but. Um, one of the things was uh, uh, running a whole bunch of virtual machines in parallel. So I tried to create a script to launch every version of Windows ever made in its own VM, with each VM having one to four cores. So DOS, Windows 3.0, Windows 3.1, Windows 3.11, Windows 95, Windows ME, Windows 2000, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, and Windows 10, but you launch them simultaneously. And memory bandwidth didn't really seem to be a problem, probably because of the monster cache. How's VM security and isolation different from Intel? Well, right now AMD's winning on CPU security for sure. I don't know if Threadripper supports the same encrypted memory virtualization stuff as Epic. Uh, there are some patches to the Linux kernel in that area, but I haven't tried that kernel yet. Maelstrom says, only us yen, but thank you guys for the silliness. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's like dollars and then Canadian pesos and then Australian pesos. I'm so sorry. It's fine. It's fine. Thank you guys for watching and supporting. And I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go. But uh, any last questions? Threadripper, excitingness, like really awesome, whatever things, magical things happening. Thanks again to Micro Center for getting me early access. Is everything magical? Is 
this ASMR alone. Whee! Can you fix the RGB bar on your machine so they are in Linux? Sorry, it's really bothering me. RGB bar? No! <laughs> Order Epic. <laughs> it has the RGB, the RGB. So I'm going to stop this, but you can replay this and also share it with your friends and like and subscribe and you know all that. Or you know if you didn't like it, that's fine too. But uh, there's a button for that. But if you did like it, like it and share it and let everybody know and we try to put it together. So thank you all for hanging out. Thank you to our patrons. Thanks to Micro Center and thanks AMD for making a really like <laughs> the market is changing a lot. Which is good. That's good. All right. I will talk to you guys later.